All right, here it is. <laughs> here it is. It's a conversation that we've been having for a while. And, you know, national football fans, maybe you're checking in on this every now and then. You know, the Patriots don't have an offensive coordinator. Josh McDaniels went to the Las Vegas Raiders, and now the Patriots have, well, who knows? A committee. <laughs> There's a committee and a subcommittee on running the offense. And in game one against the Miami Dolphins, that subcommittee and the players <laughs> came up with seven points. Seven points. Yeah. And look, Burt Breer. It's not that the Patriots have never struggled against the Dolphins before. They they've done that with McDaniel's. They've done that with Tom Brady. Mm. But it's just the way they've looked the entire summer. They haven't looked good. Right. So it, this is so unusual. Have do you have any indication that somehow magically, boom, the Patriots are going to be able to figure this out offensively with their plan and and be a, a functional offense again? I mean, I, you know, I think the hard thing, Michael, is you go from having one of the best play callers in the entire league. And, and really that's been your situation. I would argue maybe for the better part of the last 20 years, right? Like where you went from Charlie Weiss to, to, to Josh McDaniels, to Bill O'Brien, back to, to Charlie Weiss. And now it looks like something else entirely. And, you know, we've heard the whole summer and, you know, I've, I've talked about this with you. I know like, how the idea was to streamline the offense and pare it down and make the point of entry a little bit lower. You know, like this offense was so tailored to Tom Brady and they'd added for so many years without ever subtracting anything that it became really a difficult offense for newcomers to come in and learn. And so this was gonna help them cast a wider net and it was gonna help them get more out of guys like Johnny Smith and Nelson Aguilar. And, you know, I just watching on Sunday, I don't know, Michael, like the thing that kind of struck me was they still don't know what they are, you know, like it just, mm. it doesn't feel like there's a real identity to what they're doing. And you see in bits and pieces, like little things that maybe they can do well, but I don't know that there's anything that ties the whole thing together. And if you're going to streamline it, you would think, okay, like, well, the idea then is to pick a few things and get really, really good at them. And, you know, now you're, you're going to go from your strength being your complexity to your strength being your execution. And we just haven't seen that to this point. And we haven't seen evidence that it's coming either. Well, I heard you say something the other day that I actually disagree with. You said the New England Patriots are just another team. Now, talent-wise, sure, agree with that 100%. Yeah. But whether it's the, the, the Cowboys, the Steelers... Uh, the Packers, uh, the the page. I think the Patriots are in that group, and add somebody else. Where no matter what they do, even mm -hmm. if they're a disaster, we're talking about it. When they're great, we talk about it. Like the, we we will invent something to talk about. What, what when these franchises make news, they really make news yeah. with a capital N. So, do you really think the Patriots, even yeah. in this? transitional phase you think they're just another team i think people are interested even when they're not good it sort of feels that way i mean I, I i don't know i like to me like just having grown up here and remembering what it was like when i was you know a teenager and um you know going from parcells to carol they had two really good football coaches here but um you know i i, I think they got really used to over the last 20 years constantly being on the marquee you know and it's every game they were in was a big game because they were in it and I just don't know that it's that way. And I just sort of look at the way the NFL did the scheduling. And then you look at where they were on the first Sunday of the year. And that one o'clock game against Miami in Miami, it just sort of felt like one of those nondescript 1994 games to me. And maybe I'm wrong <laughs> about that. Maybe that'll change over but, the but course of the year. But of, it just but sort of Bert, felt that way to me, you know? They did get a lot of primetime games though, right? Aren't they scheduled for the Mac, which surprised me. I think they got the maximum... Prime, prime are they at the, are they maxed out though? I'm not sure if they are. Yep. I think eight teams were maxed out. I thought they were lower than the max. I thought. Yeah, I think they have. I think isn't it five? You can only you can have a max. Five is five the max. Yeah. So if they have five, then they hit the max. But yeah. So yeah, they play Sunday night. You know, a couple of Sunday nights. They have Thanksgiving night against the Vikings. So they have you know they got Monday night games. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, it I just, don't think. It just, but see, this is where I agree with you. It just felt though. to me. I don't think the just, talent matches it. Yeah, and I and I I think that, that there was an appeal the last couple of years, right? Like so, two years ago, I, I think it was what's it going to look like without Belichick? Cam Newton's there. There's a curiosity, obviously, how Cam was going to fit in in a new place after spending the rest the 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 the, the rest of his career in Carolina. Um, and you know, like last year, I think the appeal was the appeal you always have with a rookie quarterback. 
I just don't know, Mike. I, I just it just felt to me like a blah normal Sunday game, and I just it, like I'm not saying like all of a sudden they're the Jets or the Jaguars. Like I'm not saying that. Like, but I mean, I I don't know that if it stays this way for a couple of years that they're going to be, I don't know that they're on, they're on the marquee now. And like, I certainly don't think that after a couple more years of this, they would be on the marquee. It's, you know, with certain teams, there's just permanence to it. And I like, honestly, like I can remember when the Niners fell off the marquee after Montana and young, and it's just like, they didn't have the appeal either. You know, um, maybe that's just reserved to a small number of teams with the Packers and the Cowboys and the Steelers. But it just it, I, it, that Sunday game just kind of hit me as like, oh, like this is what it was like around here when I was younger. And it just, I don't know, it just felt that way to me. And maybe it was like the, maybe maybe part of it was the way the game went too. It wasn't the sexiest game yeah, to watch either. That's right. Oh, all right. So I, I, I was talking with Coach Cower about mm -hmm. uh, Lamar Jackson and, and he, made, he gave some good advice that he has stood by. Like sometimes you don't you don't necessarily need to be the top paid guy on the market mm -hmm. and you're comfortable in the organization. Okay, that's fine. But when this when the story leaked, and I'm guessing somebody with the Ravens leaked the story, let's be yeah. honest. When the story leaked that they offered him $133 million in guarantees. Yeah. And that's about a hundred million short of Deshaun Watson's guarantees. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you, Bert, but a hundred million dollar difference. That's usually not a negotiation. That's not usually a negotiation. Hey, we'll work it out. We'll figure it out. No, no problem. Ooh, that's a big problem. That is a wide. That is uh, that is the grand yeah. Canyon times three. What do you think is going to happen here with Lamar Jackson and his contract? I, I think you and I, you and I and Jim talked about this a couple weeks ago on the show um, where you know, I said like you know, a smart executive a couple of years ago said to me like, my job isn't to give a player what he's wor worth. My job is to figure out what that player can't say no to, right? And you know, I, the more I've thought about this, the more I think about how Lamar sort of operates differently and thinks differently. It's part of what makes him great. And so, like, here's the thing, right? So, I think a lot of players because of the injury rate in football, and especially those that play the game the way the, the Lamar plays it, where there is like a, an abandon to the way he plays and that he does subject himself to punishment in, in a way that few quarterbacks do, and they deploy him that way. Um, yeah, I think a lot of players would look at the 133 million and say, you know what, I can't walk away from that. At the end of the day, something terrible could happen in the next few months. And I'd never forgive myself. I just have to take the money that they're offering. Now I've pushed it for, far enough. But what if, if you're Lamar Jackson and you look at this and you look across the table and you say to yourself, I'm taking so much physical risk. They're playing me in a different way than any team plays any quarterback, maybe in the history of football, right? And so I'm taking so much physical risk on. Why should I mitigate their financial risk? Why should I protect them? So what is the, I, I don't know, Michael, like I just, the more I've like sort of dug around on this, the more I've thought about it, would it surprise you if Lamar looked at it that way and said like, wait a minute, you're asking me to take all this physical risk. Like, why is it my responsibility to be mitigating your financial risk four or five or six years from now? Yeah, maybe, maybe he does. Uh, it's, it's a fascinating topic. Uh, it, there's yeah. tension. There's tension there already just yep. because of what we know. And we didn't know it before. And See, that's what's why, interesting, that's here's what's so the, interesting about it to me. That's why the league here's what's doesn't make sense to me. That's And that's the part of it. I, I'm with you. Like, that's the part of it to me that, like, makes less sense because I, I know this. Like, that circle was small. Like, the Ravens intentionally kept the circle of people that knew what was going on small. Like, somebody there told me, like, we know – like this guy's trust, trust is important to this guy. And we yeah, know right. that like to maintain the negotiation um, and, and to keep the negotiation on the tracks and where it needs to be, we need to maintain trust with Lamar. And so we're keeping the circle small to make sure that none of the information gets out. And yeah, I mean, it makes you wonder like that, like, okay, like they get to the point where they can't get a deal. And what was it two days later, the details of the offer get out? Wow. Like if they were being so careful about like handling Lamar, right? Like handling this thing and making sure that the circle was tight and not wanting to offend Lamar by 
by by by violating the trust and then it gets out this way you sort of wonder what's going to happen when they get back to the negotiating table in february and march when it's time to tag them all right you you look at uh the teams that played the first thursday night game it was mm-hmm. bills Rams season opener and so far they both go at it uh again on sunday i'm surprised and and i'll get to it a little bit later uh in in my bets your money um put a little action <laughs> on this but i am surprised bert that the titans who looked uh, very bad on sunday yeah. uh losing to the giants that the titans though are nine and a half point dogs in buffalo i know buffalo's great i know it, it's in buffalo but nine and a half that seems pretty sizable what do you think about that matchup it's going to be interesting because, I mean, obviously, like the Titans were the number one seed in the AFC. A lot of people forget that, <laughs> like that because they got upset in that divisional round. But end to end, they were the best team in a really good conference last year. Um, they've got real identity. I think, you know, both you and I know Mike Vrabel pretty well. And, you know, I think the world of him is a head coach. And, I, you know, I, I like I think that they're going to wind up at 10, 11, 12 wins. Um, you know, I think that, that that the program's strong enough that they do end up being there. And if the Colts – don't improve from where they were last week. I think the Titans could wind up, you know, pretty easily breezing to the AFC South title. That said, the, the Bills, Woo. the Bills looked like a freaking wagon <laughs> on Thursday. I mean, like you think about this, like the margin for error that team's playing with, right? They turn the ball over four times and beat the defending Super Bowl champion in their stadium by three touchdowns. Like that. It, I, to me, it was like an eye-opening performance. And, you know, I made the comparison last a couple of weeks ago with you guys to the 07 Patriots. This sort of feels like that, that sort of felt like that game the Patriots played against the, the Chargers that year coming right out of like the Spygate stuff, right? Like, and the Spygate story had broken and you knew the players were going to come out like a house of fire. Like they were, it was going to be, they are out here to prove something. And you saw it like that night in 2007. And I think you saw a Bills team that had something to prove coming out against the Rams. And so I, I think a lot of the Titans, but going into that environment on a Monday night, how keyed up that building is going to be and the confidence the Bills are playing with now with three extra days of rest, it's a tough spot for Tennessee. All right. Well, here's my final question for you. And this is tailored for friend of the show, brother of the show, Dr. Jason Johnson who used to be, I got to check in with them. He's going to be on the show in a little bit, but I got to check in with them. He used to be a Seahawks fan, but then (laughs) Russell Wilson was traded. He became a free agent, but then the Seattle, the 12, the 12 heard about this, Bert, and they tried to recruit him to stay (laughs) in Seattle. (laughs) But anyway, uh, the Seahawks won that game. I didn't think they would. I thought they'd get blown out by the Broncos. Is there anything that you saw? I know emotional game and you can get up for a game and then go back to where you were, who you're supposed to be. Is there anything in that game that made you think, well, wait a minute. The Seahawks might be a playoff team. Or is that, or is that going too far? No, I I mean, I think that there are certain things that like, like uh, that I saw when I was there for training camp that got me encouraged that the team could be going places. And I think the main thing is the rookie class. Um, You know, and I, you know, you go back and you look at some of the early classes that John Schneider and Pete Carroll put together, um, you know, in particular, the ones in 10 and 11 and 12, you know, when you were bringing in guys like Earl Thomas and Cam Chancellor and Richard Sherman and Bobby Wagner and Russell Wilson, like they really feel strongly that this could be one of those types of classes And, and, and the bar is high there, but they think this is a class that could be a foundation for them to turn it around. And I mean, both starting tackles are rookies. It's, it's Charles cross and, and Abe Lucas, um, the running back, Kenneth Walker. Now he's still dealing with some injury stuff, but they think the world of him boy, Mafe is already contributing on the pass rush and Kobe Bryant, I, like for a rookie, like for a fourth round rookie, they thought he had a chance to be a star. Now he went to the bench early cause he got beat. Um, early in that game against Denver, but they think he's going to be a player. And then the, on the other side, you had Tariq Woolen, who's also a rookie playing. And so I think you add that to like how fast it looked they played. And, and I don't know if you picked up on this as much, Mike, but it certainly stuck out to me, like how fast the Seahawks looked out there. I'm not saying there's going to be a playoff team. I, and, and especially in that division, it's going to be tough. But I think this this team's going to be a tough out week to week. Mm-hmm. Like, and I think Gino's better That's than right. people think. And I, I, I just see this being like, 
you know, maybe like that 2010, 2011 Seahawks, those, those teams back in the early years of Carroll, where you could see the talent, you could see the speed, and maybe it you wasn't quite coming. coming. It hadn't quite come yeah. together yet, but you could see yeah. like how fast they were playing. Like, I think this could be that type of team where maybe they wind up seven and 10, but it's going to be a really competitive seven and 10 and could set the stage for bigger things down the line. Burt Breer, always appreciate the knowledge, my brother. Um, go Buckeyes, of course. They got Toledo. <laughs> they they got a tough Toledo, Toledo team. Toledo. Toledo, Toledo I, like, I, I've heard Toledo's defense They're is kind of tough. Yeah, I've heard yeah. Toledo's deep, but we got a big one next week, though. So this is a nice tune up for that. All right. Okay, so we'll see. I, I I don't want to say it's a tune-up. They sometimes struggle with these in-state battles. These in-state teams trying to mess up the big picture plan. You know who know who you oh, are. Their Super don't Bowl. get in the way. That's right. All right, Bert. Don't get. All right, thanks, Mike. Don't get in the way of our championship hopes. We're on our way. We're on our way. Hey, thanks for watching Brother from Another on YouTube. Make sure you hit subscribe before you leave and be sure to watch us 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Peacock. Appreciate you.